All right, good morning, good morning. Here we go, let's have a quick look at, that may not be quick, but let's have a look at OCS Forgotten War Korea. We're on the December 26th turn and uh, played a turn last night, played uh, two and a half turns this morning, I think maybe just two turns this morning. So I think that puts us at, let me just double check, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, yeah, this is the start of, top of uh, turn 10. So we're now <clears throat> three turns further on than we were when I, I played at the AAC Con uh, event. And haven't really progressed very much further as you can see here. Uh, from the last video, you'll note that we were around about here. But the Americans got a little punchy and decided to do a little counter-attack, which cost them a step. So they, you know, they only lost the Thai battalion, so no great... No, it wasn't the Thai battalion, it was the French battalion. So no great loss per se, but uh, certainly uh, an inflicted a loss and forced a retreat of uh, two divisions of Chinese infantry. But uh, this weakened our defensive line and has forced us now to push... Uh, armor into holding the line versus being in reserve. So that's a significant problem for the the UN forces in general. You can also see how short and brittle that line looks. Uh, there's not a lot going on underneath some of these units here. You know, <laughs> that's an artillery unit. In fact, that artillery unit really should be back one. Oh my gosh. Okay, yeah, see, look, I didn't move these guys. Maybe I did, and maybe it just sucks that bad, but... Oh, yes, you know what? We'll cheat, and we'll do this. It's one of the great things about playing solo. So we can kind of make after-the-fact adjustments. And then look at this 10-2-3 here, just waiting to die. And in the meantime, the entire northern peninsula has been cleared. All of the forces up there failed their attrition rolls uh, for the Koreans. Uh, the North, uh, for the South Koreans, for the ROC forces, that has allowed us to basically strap move all of these guys down here uh, as they now control this territory by moving in here so they can strap move up here safely without you know being too gamey on it all. So I now have uh, the 13th and I've got the other HQ here somewhere. Yeah, and the 9th Army HQs right up the front, looking to flank that entire army around the side there. And so what I did was, uh, I thought, okay, let's, let's see what would happen uh, if we had a bit of a pause, <clears throat> and if it would, if it would make uh, sense for either side to want to take a pause of, say, 10 turns, given this is a 64-turn scenario. I think early on I said it was 72. In the last video, it's 64. But let's just say, 10 turns in, we said, hey, both sides, nobody moves. Uh, you can bring on supply. You can uh, roll for replacements and accumulate replacement points. And then let's see what everybody ends up with and see how that might play out. Well, I did that for a five turn uh, set of turns and a 10 and 10 turns. And the net result of all of that would be that the Chinese would get uh, six additional regiments uh, to be added. They could probably add an HQ as well. And the UN forces would get to add uh, three uh, regiments of ROC forces and maybe one and one uh, regiment of uh, uh, Americans, which you'd probably take one of the Marine regiments because they're highly superior. They're 10-5-4s, only one steppers, but they're 10-5-4s. And uh, you uh, probably would not be able to replace any armor that it's been lost, although they're only down one or two. I've replaced one just recently. I put him here, I think. So not a big difference. There's not, gonna, there's not a lot of value in waiting or, or trying to accumulate strength. And one of the things that you would then have to agree on or decide is, you know, would you allow the UN forces to build hedgehogs? Clearly... As I mentioned earlier on, you know, this is a spot that is a problem that the UN has not addressed. They have to have a quite strong defensive position here to protect the port. Because uh, if you degrade that port, then your only opportunity to bring supply in is going to be uh, up this rail line. 
and also uh, put you in trace. And I think you'll find that with all these forces coming down, they're going to come around here. No matter how far we have to go this way, we're going to cut that rail line there. And if I get a HQ right here, I'll be able to throw that distance at their infantry-based HQs in particular. I'll be able to, um, you know, go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I can get all the way down out of screen, all the way down to here if I need to, avoiding contact and cut that rail line. So that'll cut trace off and leave only Inchon available for trace. Once I took that out, all these guys wouldn't be rolling for isolation and the game would, in, in essence, be over. Now, so what else is coming onto the, whoops, what else is coming onto the board for the Chinese and for the United Nations? Well, the Chinese get a, a 13 additional uh, three-step and two-step divisions. They receive uh, four North Korean two-step horrible units that we would use for garrisoning and I'll, I'll push everything else forward. And the Americans get, uh, let me see, uh, yeah, nothing pretty much. They get three art four artillery pieces uh, and one Commonwealth looks like, uh, I don't know what that is, it's a 233, so negligible, right? So I don't know, with an extra 13 divisions, I can put them here or here and we can just, I can afford to make horrible attacks uh, all day uh, with um, with the Chinese and with my replacement points I've got uh, as we discussed I, I would have six regiments over that period of time that I could just grind away and and put replacements into the battle uh, now what about the US Air well the US Air Force uh, both uh, all you know three arms the Marines the Navy and the land USAF forces all doing okay we have lost two full units. We lost, uh, let me just bring these guys on. Now, of course, there's one other thing we need to consider as well. So those two guys uh, being lost, actually that's their flip side. You'll see that these guys were quite decent. There's a 14, right? It's the equivalent of a Stuka unit, basically. Um, what was I gonna say? So there's some air that we could do and there's three T that we can fly in to the airfield, assuming it's uh, secured and available. We can do that every turn, but 3T is not gonna feed all the units here. So, what am I saying? What I'm feeling is that, you know, bar grinding out uh, a few more turns, we're, we're kind of at an end point because I've lost too many units to be able to put up a, a decent defense. And that's it's kind of unfortunate because I was looking to see how this might play out over, you know, at the 30 turn mark and whether or not we have to abandon Seoul and, you know, race back down to Pusan, right? Uh, which is not going to solve any problems. Let's have a look at that section of the map and see what that looks like. We'll just adjust the camera if you'll bear with me. I'm going to have to move a few pieces. All right, let's get rid of this. I've got my charts here and my little turn track. It keeps me mostly honest when I don't skip phases. So we can see Pusan all the way down there. And uh, this is the main rail that they'll, they'll have to trace, uh, do trace on. It's the only one they can really use because the rail ends here and then re establishes itself here and goes up uh, up this way. So this is the primary rail for trace supply. So I can imagine if we abandoned Seoul now and took all of our forces, all of these forces, and attempted to do a runner and uh, fight a staged withdrawal all the way down, we could probably turtle up in Pusan. But at that point, this is one of the victory lines here, and the last one is down here. So you can see the, I don't know if you can see the yellow lines in the video. Let me zoom in a little bit for you. See that yellow line there? They run right across. And as long as you've got a unit or you, you pass a unit through these control circles, that gives you control. And that's a, a phase line 
that allows you to claim uh, a victory level, obviously smashing through the Poussin perimeter line would give you a strategic victory. That's this one down here. Oops, where is it? I'm sorry, I'm zoomed in so we can't see. There we go, right there. So that's uh, it's pretty interesting. Now, I, so I'm, I'm debating whether or not I want to want to do this sort of fighting withdrawal and uh, and declare victory or just to declare victory now. I've done a fighting withdrawal for 10 turns and it really hasn't been a whole lot of fun for the poor old Americans and the, and the UN forces. Uh, it is, uh, and, and we're also extremely low on supply because I've been building all these hedgehogs. So I'm, I'm at, uh, actually at a point where I literally only have uh, two or three SP on the board to feed uh, defense and to feed the, the movement of armored units, of which there are several on the board. And we're gonna, so anyway, I, I'm thinking I'm gonna wrap it up here. I've enjoyed the play. The gameplay is very dynamic. It's a very interesting uh, scenario, this Chinese intervene scenario. I really, uh, I really have enjoyed it immensely. I would probably play it again at a con and see if uh, we could get a different result with it, you know, either with the same or different opponent. Uh, and uh, I highly, highly encourage you of the of the game of the gamers slash multi man publishing OCS titles. This one's uh, number nine. That's just the second edition. I'd encourage you to, if you're into OCS, if you don't have it, you probably should get it because it's pretty cool. All right, I'm going to uh, leave it at that. Talk to you soon. Time to pack up. We'll see what gets next. Uh, gets onto the table next. Ciao.